So today's announcements. Um, the chapter four sapling is due 9 a.m. Friday. And I have the stack of exam grades here. They're all done. If you got points back, you should have seen your score update in Canvas on Monday. So um, you can pick the exam back up from me after lecture, either today or Friday. After that, they'll go back to your recitation TAs. OK, questions about that? Cool. OK, so what we were looking at last time, we started chapter five on Monday. Um, so we are still looking at alkene addition reactions. Okay, so this chapter is kind of a follow-on from chapter four where we start looking at a lot more reactions. Okay, so we saw ways to add um, two halogens to an alkene. We saw ways to add a halogen and an OH. And, a ways, and ways to add a halogen and an OR. So just to put those up here, here's sort of the three that we covered last time. So like Br2 by itself gives you two halogens or Br2 and water gives you a halogen on the less substituted carbon and an OH on the more substituted carbon, or Br2 and an alcohol gives you a bromine on the less substituted and an OR on the more substituted. All right, so we covered the mechanisms for all three. They're all more or less the same. If you miss lecture, go ahead and check out the notes for that and make sure you understand what's going on. Okay. Um, so what we're going to look at today is a mechanism that has some things in common with this reaction, but it also has quite a few significant differences as well. Um, so this one, its name is kind of a mouthful. We're going to look at oxymercuration reduction. Okay, so again, like a lot of the names for reactions that we're going to cover, the name kind of tells you what's going on. Um, the first step is we're adding an oxygen and a mercury to the molecule. And then um, a lot of these hyphenated names, it's sort of a two-part process. So the first step does something, oxymercuration, and then the second step does reduction. Um, we won't get into redox chemistry for a while, but um, that might make more sense later on. For now, we're just going to cover it without getting too in-depth on step two. Okay, so before we go into the mechanism for this, um, let's talk a little bit about why we actually need this reaction, because it turns out this is a really convenient workaround for a really common problem. Um, so we know that one of the reactions we saw in chapter four is acid-catalyzed hydration, and that adds um, an H and an OH to the molecule. Um, so the H adds to the less substituted carbon, the OH to the more substituted carbon. So we saw this reaction Markovnikov style in chapter four. Um, this one is also going to be Markovnikov style. So it's the same as acid-catalyzed hydration. But the big useful thing about this reaction is that it avoids carbocations forming. So you never have to worry about carbocation rearrangement. So we don't have any nasty surprises as far as what the molecule is going to end up looking like. OK, so an example of when this would be extremely useful is, say we want to do 
this alkene going to isn't it this alcohol okay so you look at this you say okay I'm adding an OH to the more substituted carbon of the alkene um, I haven't shown it explicitly but we can draw it in there I'm adding an H to the less substituted carbon of the alkene that's Markovnikov style why don't I try acid catalyzed hydration but Um, as soon as you start going through the mechanism for this, you're going to realize that this is not going to work for acid catalyzed. So you start out protonating the alkene. You get a carbocation here after the H adds. And immediately, we've just made a secondary carbocation. So with this really substituted carbon right next door, this thing is not going to sit around like this for very long. It's immediately going to undergo an alkyl shift, specifically a methyl shift. One of these methyls is going to hop over onto that carbocation. and it's going to sit around like that instead. So as a reminder, if you missed some of the lectures last week, um, carbocations want to be as substituted as possible, and they want it so strongly that they're actually going to shuffle some alkyl or hydrogen groups around to achieve that if necessary. So we go from a secondary carbocation to what's now a tertiary. So that's why this happens. Okay, so at that point, the carbocation sits around for a bit. Eventually, water stumbles along, sticks onto it. And I'm going to stop drawing this H out here just because we don't really need to keep track of it anymore. But um, the last step is we just need to deprotonate this. So that gets us to there. Um, so that was not at all what we were shooting for. OK, so the whole point of doing oxymercuration reduction is to avoid this whole nonsense of carbocation rearrangement and just do a simple addition to the alkene where everything else stays put. And I'm going to call this oxymerc for short. Okay, so um, I'm going to write out the reagents on the arrow here. It's a lot of stuff going on, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what each thing does and why we need it in a second here. Okay, so oxymercuration will give us exactly what we want, just the OH and the H added to the alkene. And the reagents that we're going to do that, going to use for that, are... All right, so HG is the abbreviation for mercury. Um, we're going to use mercury with two of these OAC groups on it. I'll explain what that means in a second. And then we also need water. And we need something else, a solvent called THF, which I'll show in a minute as well. And then for step two, we need... NaBH4, and there's a couple ways you can write this, but NaOH is one of them, or just some source of OH minus. Okay, so a lot going on here on this arrow. Um, I guess even before we get into the details on the reagents, um, one thing that's worth pointing out is this bit here, where I have one parenthesis, two parenthesis, is absolutely crucial for writing this reaction correctly. So what this is saying is that it's a two-step reaction. I have this alkene sitting in my flask. First I add all this stuff for step one, then I wait a little while, and then I add this stuff for step two. If I didn't have these numbers here, this would actually be incorrect and would cost you points on an exam. Because without the numbers, it's just saying we chuck 
all this stuff on the arrow into the pot at once and probably parts of it are going to react with other parts and you won't actually get the alkene involved in a way that you want. So any reaction I put up with multiple steps, make sure that you're sort of learning it as multiple steps and make sure that you write it down as multiple steps. And we'll see a few other multi-steps in this chapter as well. So above or below the arrow doesn't matter at all. I kind of by convention, if I've got a bunch of stuff to write on the arrow, I split it so about half is above and half is below. But having it be step one and step two is crucial. So you could, sort of as a side box here, you can do like something goes to something and you can say like step one, two, three, I guess this is now multi-steps, four, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that's fine, just it doesn't matter like where you have the arrow, if it's like between step one and two or two and three, just make sure that if they do have to be separate steps that you keep those steps as like individual numbered portions. So you could have the arrow here or here or here, doesn't matter but numbering does matter. Okay, so I know I'm harping on that a bit, but this tends to be like sort of a thing that people think is inconsequential and it really does make a difference for the outcome of the reaction. Alrighty, um, so questions about that so far? Okay, cool. <clears throat> Alrighty, so in terms of what's actually going on with the stuff on the arrow here, Okay, so the reagents, um, so HgOAC2, um, what this looks like is, obviously based on the formula, a mercury with a couple of these OAC groups coming off of it. Um, so AC is an abbreviation that we haven't seen before. Um, so AC is, is acetyl and that's just a carbonyl with a methyl group on it. So um, I guess this is kind of those two and three letter alkyl group abbreviations that we've seen before. Um, this is sort of one example that we didn't get into because technically it's not alkyl. Um, we have a carbonyl there which actually changes its behavior quite a bit, but it does still get its own two-letter abbreviation, AC, um, which means that ACO or OAC, depending on which direction you're writing it, is acetoxy. And that just looks like an oxygen and then the rest of the AC group. Okay, so we're looking at mercury with a couple of these things on it. Um, drawing the whole thing out is kind of unnecessary. I think um, there is one sapling problem for this chapter where they actually do make you draw out both acetoxy groups in detail, unfortunately, because they don't have an abbreviation for AC. Um, but aside from that, you shouldn't usually have to get bogged down in the details of what's going on in here. Um, I guess kind of a humorous side note, there is an element that's abbreviated as AC. Um, I think it's actinium. Um, yeah, it's the first of the actinides. Um, but uh, we're not looking at the element actinium. This is just organic chemists not bothering to make sure that they're using unique abbreviations because we don't really look that far down the periodic table a lot of the time. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's the mercury part of this oxymercuration reduction. Um, water, hopefully you're familiar with. Um, <laughs> THF is a new one though. So this is not actually a formula at all. This is an acronym. It stands for tetrahydrofuran. And that looks like 
five-membered ring with four carbons and an oxygen in it. Um, this is named after furan, which I guess based on the name is going to be this structure but missing four hydrogens. So it's actually got two degrees of unsaturation added to this. And that pretty much means the only place that you could reasonably add those degrees of unsaturation is going to look like that. So furan is kind of, um, for reasons we'll get into much later, what turns out to be an aromatic ring that shows up sometimes. And then tetrahydrofuran is like this, but with a bunch of H's added to its alkenes, so it's all single bonds now. Um, so the reason this shows up in this reaction is not because it's doing anything chemically. But it's a decent solvent for the other stuff we're trying to react. Um, and I guess those of you taking lab have already seen a little bit about solvent polarity and how it affects reactions and TLC, things like that. Um, we'll talk about it in lecture um, in more detail in a few chapters from now. Um, but it turns out this reaction is a little bit tricky because we're trying to bring together both this alkene, which is quite nonpolar and soluble in like hexane, stuff like that, and water, which is pretty polar. And we are also trying to dissolve the mercury acetate at the same time, which is fairly polar. And it turns out having THF around just lets everything mingle pretty well and combine. It's nonpolar enough to dissolve the alkene, and it's polar enough to dissolve water decently well. So it turns out this is the key to getting this reaction to actually go in a reasonable amount of time. OK, so that's THF. Um, and then the stuff below the arrow, sodium borohydride, um, again, we're not going to get into too much details on what's going on here, but this basically, all we need to know about is it's something that will replace an OH, um, or no, sorry, um, replaces a mercury with H. during this reaction. OK. <laughs> I guess I've seen a joke mechanism where this comes along and just pulls the lowercase g off and turns the hg into an h, but that's not what's going on. <laughs> OK. So um, what this reaction actually looks like. So I mentioned when I did the title up here that it's actually surprisingly similar mechanism to the stuff we covered last time. Oops, sorry, question? OK. So the mechanism, we're only looking at step one. OK, so I'm going to take an alkene again. And I'm going to take my mercury here with its two acetoxy groups trailing off of it. Um, the way this normally gets covered for the time being is by showing mercury having sort of a lone pair there. That's middlingly accurate. Um, transition metals are a little bit different from um, sort of non-transition metals in terms of how lone pairs behave, but um, it's good enough for our purposes for now. We'll cover transition metals in OCHEM too. Okay, so this step is actually identical arrow pushing to when we made the bromonium ring. So if you know that step, you know this one already. So the alkene goes out and attacks one atom. That atom has to drop a leaving group. So instead of attacking a bromine and dropping a bromine, you're attacking a mercury, dropping an acetoxy. And meanwhile, the thing you attacked, the mercury in this case, is attacking back onto the more substituted carbon. So same three arrows, just different atoms involved. 
and you're still making a similar three-membered ring. Now it's, I guess, mercuronium, maybe, something like that. Um, the new atom that's part of the ring is positive charged. Um, note that one difference that is kind of noticeable between this and bromine is that this actually had two other things on it to start out with. One gets dropped off during the reaction, which means the other one sticks around the whole time. So you should still have one OAC after this step on here. But the other one just got kicked out with a minus charge, so that's out of the picture now. Okay. So from here, um, we're going to do exactly the same thing we did for halohydrin formation. We got this three-membered ring with a positive charge on an atom. We got water molecule hovering around nearby. It's going to go for the more substituted atom, a more substituted carbon atom, and pop that ring open, just like it did for halohydrin formation or for dihalogenation. Okay, so again, just like halohydrin formation, water was neutral when it did the attack, so we'd expect to be positively charged afterwards. So the last thing we got to do is clean that up by just pulling a proton off of there. Um, you can use either another molecule of water, or you can use OAC minus, or you can just be deliberately vague about it and not show anything in particular coming for it. Um, I'll just randomly choose OAC minus this time because I think that's what I have in the notes. Oh no, in the notes I use water. Yeah, so either way around doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, so we've got our HGOAC, our mercury um, group on the less substituted carbon and our OH group on the more substituted carbon. Okay, so that's it. Like, for the first half of this reaction, it's oxymercuration, and we've added our oxygen, we've added our mercury, we're done. That was step one. Um, step two, um, we're not going to cover the mechanism at all. We're just saying sodium borohydride, NaOH, and magically, we're replacing the mercury with a hydrogen group. Okay. So, um, questions about this part, or anything about this reaction? Okay. Cool. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hmm? Um, so it turns out this is necessary for letting this thing do its job. Um, yeah, we totally don't get into any detail on how that works at all, so it's just uh, unfortunately just memorize these reagents for the time being and we'll explain it later on. Yeah, which is deeply unsatisfying and I know it sucks to like memorize stuff without knowing what's going on, but we'll get to that later. Okay, other question. Uh-huh. So this is Exactly, yeah, and it's also worth pointing out that this is specifically Markovnikov style, so when all is said and done, I've added the OH to the more substituted carbon and the H to the less, so the next reaction we're going to cover is actually going to be the flip of that. So, yeah? How do you know Excellent question. So there's tons of times where either reaction is totally fine and good, um, because... If you don't have to worry about rearrangements for your particular molecule, then you can get away with either. So, so if rearrangements are not an issue, um, that's one consideration. The other is, so alkenes are pretty much the only functional group we've done anything with so far. Um, but it turns out when we start looking at other functional groups, tons of stuff um, do some weird things in acid. They fall apart or rearrange to other functional groups. 
And so it turns out if we use acid on our alkene, and there happens to be, say, like an ether or a ketone or something else in the molecule, having acid around might mess that up. And so acid is kind of hitting it with a sledgehammer a little bit. Um, mercury, uh, oxymercuration is a little bit more finesse to it and targets just alkenes. So, um, in other words, if there are no other functional groups that are acid sensitive, So um, this example, the simple alkene that I used up here for the mechanism, actually meets both those criteria. Like there's nothing else going on in that molecule functional group wise. wise. And um, rearrangements are not an issue. So this one, I could just as easily have said, right, throw you an acid, and boom, I'm done. Um, so a lot of the time we have options, it's just sometimes we want to avoid some of those options because of unwanted side effects on the rest of the molecule. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions about this before I move on? Okay, cool. All righty. So the next one we're going to cover is also a two-parter. And this is called hydroboration. Oxidation. Okay, so again, the name tells you what's going on. First we add hydrogen and boron, and then we do something to oxidize it, which again, redox chemistry, we're kind of glossing over that a lot until the end of the semester, or close to the end of the semester. Okay, so ultimately, what we're going to do is add H and OH, but we're adding it what's called anti-Markovnikov style. Okay, so let me throw up a couple examples here. So alkene, and again, um, there's a bunch of reagents here. I'll write them up first, uh, and then we can talk about what they mean afterwards. But it is important to point out that this is a hyphenated name here, hydrobration, then oxidation. We should expect to see step one on the arrow, then step two on the arrow. This is going to be a two-parter. Okay, so first up, we're going to use BH3. And then we're going to use a bunch of reagents that are all H's and O's. So H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide, H2O is water, and OH minus, which you can also see written as like some specific hydroxide like NaOH or KOH, um, is base. Okay, so we're doing the same addition to an alkene thing, the pi bond's going away. But instead of adding an OH here and an H here, we're doing it the other way around. So OH adds to the less substituted carbon and H to the more. Okay, so that's the complete opposite of what we've seen before for um, all of the reactions where we add like an H and a not an H thing. Um, so we're going to have to figure out why that's happening, um, which we can understand by looking at the mechanism in a couple minutes here. Okay, um, one more example. Here's our alkene. And let's use BH3, H2O2, H2O. OH minus. All right, and again, we're going to get the hydrogen on the more substituted carbon and the OH on the less. Okay, so if you want to take a minute while I erase the board real quick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so, um, so this reaction, hydroboration oxidation, involves adding an H and an OH anti-Markovnikov style. Um, just as a quick comparison, so compared to acid catalyzed or oxymeric reduction, which are both Markovnikov, where we take the same alkene, we hit it with H3O plus, and we're adding the OH to the more substituted and the H to the less substituted. Okay, so this might seem kind of a trivial thing, but there are some times when you're trying to build a particular molecule and you're like, I absolutely need to get this particular group on this particular carbon. Having both of these options available at your fingertips is sometimes incredibly helpful. Just being able to choose which atom adds where in your molecule opens up a lot of options for you sometimes. And we'll sort of see like how to tie that into a bigger plan later on once we've got a few more reactions under our belt. Okay. Um, So a couple more things about the reagents that we're using before we go on. Um, so BH3 is borane. And you can use straight borane. Um, it's a gas at room temperature, I believe. And I think you have to bubble it through the reaction, which is kind of a pain. Um, or you can use a few different options that are sort of like borane in some form that's a little bit more workable that releases BH3 during the reaction. Um, so one of these is B2H6, which I think is more manageable. Um, so that's diborane. Or you might see a few different ways of writing it, or it's BH3 dot something. So BH3 dot THF is real common. That means it actually does this weird complexing thing where BH3 sort of binds onto THF and then stays in solution. Um, so boring THF complex. Um, there's a few others where you can complex it to other stuff. BH3 dot diglime, you might see, which is a borane diglime complex. Um, there's a few others like BH3 dot ether, but all of them are pretty much interchangeable for our purposes. Really, you just want to look for something that's going to release BH3 during the reaction. So all of these, you could write any or all of them on the arrow. You could see any or all of them on the arrow. Um, for your purposes, for remembering just like the simplest way to write this reaction, probably just stick with BH3 is the easiest. Okay, so um, the mechanism for this, um, it helps to remember that BH3 is actually uh, an atom with an unfilled, uh, molecule with an unfilled octet on boron. So it's got an empty p orbital sitting around. So if we're going through and looking at sort of the frontier molecular orbitals on this reaction again, that might actually sort of help explain or help you remember why things happen the way they do. OK, so we've got our alkene here. And we've got boron, which is sitting around with this empty p orbital, no lone pair. It's just got a great space to plug in some incoming electrons when it gets attacked. So you could initially think about, why don't I just treat this like I'm attacking a proton or something? 
why don't I send my alkene out, attack to the empty orbital on boron, and if I did that, that would get me to here, where now boron just got a surplus of electrons coming at it. It's now negative. And the more substituted of the two carbons is positive. Okay, so that is what would happen if boron behaved exactly like a proton. Um, but we sort of saw when we were looking at, say, dihalogenation last time, that if there's any way for this molecule to avoid having to make a carbocation in the first place, it's going to weasel out of it any way that it can. Um, let me actually move this minus charge over a little bit, because it's out of the way of what I'm about to show. So um, this carbocation is not at all happy about existing. What's actually going to happen is this BH sigma bond is going to hop over here onto the carbocation. and end up adding an H onto here. OK, so this all looks like reasonable arrow pushing. Um, we've got high electron density attacking low electron density, and then the same thing again. Um, but again, kind of like dihalogenation, where I showed like a reasonable mechanism if we assume it starts out the same as other stuff we've seen. Um, showing it this way kind of implies that there's a carbocation forming during the reaction, which then immediately gets sorted out. Um, but when people actually look at this reaction spectroscopically, they see that there is never any actual carbocation that gets formed. So again, just like I did for dihalogenation, this is not really part of the mechanism. This is not an intermediate that ever exists as its own like separate thing. So we're going to sort of combine all the arrows show this step happening and this step happening at the same time and just skip right ahead to here and bypass the carbocation entirely. So, what actually happens is we have the alkene here, we have borane down here, Alkene goes out and attacks boron, and simultaneously, one of the BH bonds slides over onto the more substituted carbon, which is kind of crucial for the final outcome of how this reaction ends up working out. So we can sort of explain why the, what's called the regiochemistry happens, why things end up going anti-Markovnikov, by explaining it as, if we did go through a carbocation mechanism, we'd end up with an H adding over onto here, even though we don't go through a full carbocation mechanism, we're still following the same arrow pushing for that. And so we end up with BH2 adding to the less substituted carbon, and H, which is the hydride, hopping onto the more substituted carbon. Uh -huh. um, on this one here? Um, well, so we are showing it breaking, but we're not showing the electrons dumping onto the H. Um, we're showing the BH electrons going into a new CH bond, Yeah, if that makes sense. So yeah, you can go ahead and I guess this would be a, like bonds to one atom become bonds, uh, become a different bond to that atom um, move where like the H is taking its bond electrons and using them to make a new bond to carbon, if that makes sense, yeah. Okay, so other questions about that stuff. Okay, cool. So um, all in one fell swoop, we're adding uh, not an H group and an H group. And this is kind of how the regiochemistry ends up working out the way it does. We're adding the more um, electron rich part onto the more substituted carbocation. So even though this is anti-Markovnikov, And I end up abbreviating anti-Markovnikov as anti-Mark a lot of the time, just to save on writing. If your name is Mark, I'm sorry, it's nothing personal. <laughs> um, so it's an anti-Markovnikov outcome, 
where I've added the not an H group onto the less substituted carbon. Um, but if you look at it, if you look at it, the underlying reason is kind of the same as it was for the Markovnikov style mechanisms. Um, it's just whatever group is more electron rich is going to end up on the more substituted carbon. And so when we're doing acid catalyzed stuff, <laughs> the group that was more electron rich ends up adding onto here. Down here, we're dealing with some H's that are acting more like hydrides, where they have electrons of their own to go spend in making bonds. And so they end up on the more substituted carbon. Um, OK, so I guess we need to finish this up. We, we show the mechanism for step one. Um, we're not actually getting into the details on step two. If you're curious what's happening, um, I think the study guide actually goes into more detail on it. But but all this stuff, peroxide, base, and water, replaces the BH2 with an OH. So like that. So really, step one is the only part that we look at, because by this point, things are already set in terms of regiochemistry. The carbons have already got their H or not an H group. And then all we need to do is just tweak the particular details of what that not an H group is. OK. Um, so other questions about that reaction? Yeah. Ah, so diborane actually does split apart reversibly into boron, so it's still like for any of these reagents, it's just going to be BH3 that you would show for the mechanism. Yeah, although that does raise one more question, which I'm going to cover in like the two minutes I have left here. And that is, what's going on with the other two H's out of my BH3? Because it turns out each BH bond can do this with a separate alkene. So you can have up to three times of this reaction happening per BH3 molecule. So in other words, we do, for example, bloop, bloop. OK, so we've added one alkene. And now we can do it again, tack the borons and the H, the more substituted carbon. Like that. And then we can do it one more time. Uh, I think I have one too many carbons up there. OK. Do it once again. And add it to a third alkene. And so we can stick up to three copies of our original molecule on here. But then when we do the workup, all of them come off the boron at about the same time. And so the end result is the same. So if we're doing this on a test, you are OK to show just one copy of the alkene per borane molecule. You don't have to show this. But it does mean that economically um, and practically, this reaction, you can get away with using only one third as much borane as you might expect. So it's a three to one stoichiometry. OK. Um, any questions about that? OK, cool. <laughs>